Boom. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Okay. Now let's dive back into what we were just talking about on coffeetruther.com. Yeah. So um, I get a lot of people who have uh, seen my uh, TEDx talk mm -hmm. that I did back in uh, 2012 and they contact me. Many people are interested in uh, my discoveries, what I have to say, and start following me. And since that time that I've done that talk, I created a lot of videos. I started this uh, thing called Coffee University, which was a YouTube channel, which I've created uh, um, to inform people about different things about coffee. Because I think that the big coffee companies uh, market coffee in such a way that I see has a lot of outright lies in it, right? Because the big coffee companies, uh, their business model is based on marketing, packaging, and shelf life. And what I discovered was that there was uh, a lot of things that simply <laughs> weren't true with what I was reading or talking about with the conventional, conventional wisdom, yep. which is really conventional ignorance, it's uh, just um, peddled off as wisdom. But uh, what, when I started testing and finding out uh, some things about coffee that I was discovering that was really very surprising to me, and I would talk to other people, they would disagree or not know what I'm talking about. Um, and I would hear them repeat things that I knew that they read online. Because I was reading the same stuff, and I was like, wait a minute, this stuff isn't, isn't true, you know? And people weren't doing their own testing. I started doing my own testing. And so I started to realize that this was a, a, a branch of being a truther. I call myself a coffee truther. Yeah. Um, and this guy contacted me. He, he had already purchased the, the URL, <laughs> coffeetruther.com. And he said that he wanted to do something together with me. And he's a brilliant um, uh, marketer uh, online. His name is Brian Griffiths. He's actually in Pennsylvania. And it's only about an hour and a half from where I grew up in uh, Princeton, New Jersey, where I am right now, actually visiting my mom. But uh, anyway, he, he created this one site. And he was able to put all of my things together on this one site, which was really uh, very helpful. All the different videos, all the articles, all this stuff that I've been Kind of talking about and um, promoting for the last, you know, six, set, seven years. You put it uh, into this one one site, coffeetruther.com. That so, is awesome. uh, yeah, awesome. So, okay, but well, we got to go all the way back to when you really were getting interested in coffee, understanding it, and just where the evolution of what you're doing now came about. Oh, perfect. That's a great. That's a great place to start. In the uh, early 2000s, in 2003, um, uh, my wife at the time, we were living in Los Angeles, and we moved up to Southern Oregon. And in Los Angeles, I was, you know, like everybody else, going to Starbucks, going to some local cafes and getting my coffee that way. But uh, we were moving to an area which was pretty remote. It was on 20 acres of land in the middle of the forest. And I knew there wasn't going to be any local coffee place oh, yeah. uh, which I could visit. And so I realized that uh, I had to become a home barista. I had to start learning about coffee. I'm going to have to do this myself, right? So one of the first things that I knew that I had to get was an espresso machine. Because I really liked espresso and uh, I wanted to do this right. And I had known enough that the real cheap plastic kind of $100 oh, yeah. espresso machines just make a worse cup of coffee, actually, <laughs> <laughs> than not. Um, and so I started do, doing some uh, research and some looking online. And I found on eBay a machine called the La Pavoni. It's an Italian machine. It's uh, just a, a one group, a single uh, espresso uh, machine that where it has a handle that you yep. um, pull it down and uh, it was in the range of about three hundred four hundred dollars which was around my budget at the time and I was able to uh, acquire it and also I knew enough that I I needed a burr grinder not a blade grinder like a blender oh. but a burr grinder right yeah, yeah. Was, like, oh my god ridiculous um so i had my bird grinder and i had my espresso machine moved up to oregon okay now i'm getting 
into it. I'm practicing my home barista skills you know, every morning and getting a little bit better, especially in the first uh, few months. But then like I, I hit a plateau and it wasn't really getting any better. And I was really frustrated with it. And I was trying some coffees, the coffee I was buying at the time, Costco. Yeah. <laughs> I'd buy a big amount, already roasted beans from Costco. Uh, they also uh, had coffee uh, occasionally from Pete's. Um, but pretty much the big coffee roasters packaged in five pound bags, right? Mm, yeah. That were vacuum sealed bags. And I was trying the different varieties, but what I was finding was that they all tasted about the same. So it, it, it didn't alert me that maybe the coffee I'm using is the problem. Mm -hmm. it, it made it almost seem like all the roasted coffee was the same anyway, so it didn't yeah. matter. It was my barista skills. So you know, what am I not doing right with my barista skills, right? And so I thought I just had to, to uh, get better at it. And doing this for like, couple of years, <laughs> right? And the coffee's just passable, but it, you know, it's not, not great or anything. Yeah. And uh, I have some friends, some not, not only friends, actually some, uh, some second cousins, some relatives that came to visit from Israel, right? And um, the husband uh, is really into making cakes and coffee too. You know, he has a espresso machine and he's into the whole thing. And I, I had already been at his house and tasted his espresso. I said, I, you know, I think I could do a better job. You come see me, I'll make it for you. So here I'm gearing up for them, <laughs> them to come and um, practicing my skills. And they're, they're there. And I make the best coffee at the time that I was capable of making. Yeah. Right? Uh, pulled the best shot of espresso I could and served it to him, you know. And I was like proudly thinking, what do you think? And, uh, Eh, you know, he's shaking his head. Eh. <laughs> I was devastated. I was devastated, you know, because I thought that here it was. I worked so hard to get this right, and yeah. it just wasn't there. And that's it. We didn't have any conversation with anything more than that because I don't think he even realized um, uh, mm. anything different about coffee or anything like that. And so the next, the very next week, I had a uh, commercial property that I was doing a lease signing with, and the people I were uh, that, that were becoming my tenants uh, were uh, found out that I was really into coffee. And at the signing, they presented me with a plastic Ziploc bag which had roasted coffee in it, mm. and they said they really knew that I was really into coffee, and you know they roasted this coffee themselves at home in a pot air popcorn popper. And at the time, I didn't know what they were talking about. You know, yeah. I really didn't. And so I said, okay, you know, thanks. But it, it didn't really hit me. Um, took it home, you know, threw it in the cabinet. Next morning, you know, I wake up and uh, I'm looking for my Starbucks blend coffee that's already been roasted. And I find I don't have enough. I'm out. You know, what am I going to do? And then it hit me. I realized I had this, this baggie of this coffee that was given to me the night before, you know. And so I do my barista thing. I'm grinding it and, uh, and pulling a shot of espresso. And so, I, and I wasn't doing it consciously because if I was doing it consciously, mm -hmm. right after I ground it, I would have noticed the aromas were so much better than anything I had experienced yeah. before, right? So, um, uh, I pull a shot and make it just the way I like it. Sit down. I took a sip. And epiphany. Man, it was unbelievable. I went, whoa. This was I, what I had been searching for for years. It w had another dimension to it. You yeah. know, I could yep. feel so much energy and aliveness from it. I mean, it, it hit me like a ton of bricks. It was like. Whoa! Couldn't believe it, oh, yeah. and and this this epiphany, I felt like I had newly discovered something like a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, you know? Yeah. That, and I knew it in that moment. This was changing my life. I didn't know how. I remember my 
my knees are weak and everything. I had to sit down and just contemplate this for for many minutes, you know, because this was something that just was like uh, completely out of anything I could imagine experiencing. It was that, that powerful, that potent. That's a pretty uh, pretty uh, strong statement, right? But yeah. uh, um, so I realized it was the coffee and it was when it was roasted and the freshness of when it was roasted. So I started to do some research online and found that this was a really fast growing niche market, home roasters. Oh yeah. Home roasting. And they had been doing this, you know, for quite a, a while. And I started to see how people were home roasting. And one of the ways was on a barbecue grill. Really? Yeah. And I said, I have a four burner barbecue grill outside. At the time I had just uh, switched to um, eating mostly raw food because my wife mm. became a raw food chef. And so I wasn't grilling any meats or anything like yeah. that. Right? <laughs> so I'm like, I have this huge barbecue grill outside. Why don't I use it? Yeah. And uh, I was able to get a, a one pound, a small one pound drum, uh, got some green coffee and I hooked up a chicken rotisserie skewer and a mm -hmm. little motor, chicken rotisserie motor that turned that, drum, you know, three oh. rounds a minute. You know, <laughs> totally Which is not nearly enough to get a good, uh, consistent roast. So, but I was using it and it was still amazing because it was fresh roasted. Mm -hmm. So it confirmed to me that that was the key to, to all of this coffee. It wasn't about the, um, uh, the brewing, how I'm brewing it. It wasn't about the $20,000 espresso machine, you know. No. The main thing here was what coffee am I using and is it fresh roasted? Not even so much where the coffee's from, but is it fresh roasted? Does it have that energy? Is that impact um, on it, you know? So, uh, so I just started to roast at home and this one pound drum didn't last long after, you know, <laughs> a few weeks I'm like, I got to roast more. This is great. So I got a five pound drum and I got, a, <laughs> I got a motor, 60 RPM motor. Oh, so now I'm humming, man. And, and I'm starting to roast and share with my friends. And they couldn't believe it. They had the same reaction that I had. Yep. They could not believe how good coffee could be. You know, and I was, I was telling them right away, use it right away. Don't store it. Don't wait to use it. Here's fresh roasted coffee. Use it. Start tomorrow, mm -hmm. right? And, and they were having this incredible reaction. I realized I had a burgeoning business going because they wanted more, right? Totally. And, and then it's interesting, uh, a, a friend of mine who's this kind of inventor uh, guy, very, uh, uh, very smart, wise, brilliant guy, coffee lover too. His name awesome. is Wolf Ball. And Rourke came over. He said, I love this coffee. I got to see what you're doing. And he comes over and he sees me roasting on this <laughs> four burner barbecue grill, right? <laughs> he goes, man, you are using, you're wasting so much propane. This is, this is ridiculous. Let's make a custom one. Let's, let's go in my garage. And he had this kind of workshop garage and, you know, get some stainless steel. He knew how to do all that stuff. He said, yeah. let's make a, a customized version. Uh, and so I said, okay. So that winter we went into uh, to his uh, garage workshop and we created my, first commercial coffee roaster it was a five pound roaster and i started roasting on that thing and selling my coffee and uh it was uh, uh the start of me creating um the commercial roaster that i later uh created a bigger commercial model which was an eight kilo which is like a 16 uh 16 pound 17 pound roaster um and that i sold uh, throughout the world to commercial enterprises, to uh, cafes, because my idea at the time was cafes should be all should be roasting their own coffee. Yeah. Every cafe, yes. that's when they have control over the process. That's when they're going to have the best coffee. Period. Right. And when I would looked at commercial roasters, I could not believe the prices. There were commercial roasters out there, and some of them were bigger, some not so big. But they kind of look like old steam engine parts yeah. were taken yeah. and put together for these roasters, and they cost tens of thousands of dollars. Wow. 
uh, it's ridiculous. I mean, through the roof as far as the price. And I'm going, who is able to afford this car? You have a small yeah. cafe. You're going to sink $50,000 into a road trip. <laughs> yeah. No, but right? Starbucks will. Yeah, exactly. And, and uh, um, they roast these huge, huge quantities. Uh, uh, but the other thing that uh, was kind of stuck in the back of my mind was the, my heat source. Mm. And my heat source was propane, right? Mm -hmm. So there's questions, legitimate questions about what is in that propane and what kind of additives are in that propane and are those chemicals affecting the coffee bean? You mm. know, if you're using propane to burn it, it's kind of like if you're barbecuing meat and you're using propane to barbecue that meat, you know, what is the possible chemicals that you're ingesting along with it yeah right? 100 so yeah so more, more recently um i have created a home roaster and a commercial model coming that is something that's called fluid bed roasting and fluid bed roasting is roasting with hot air hot air only so you use electricity heat up the air and the air is what roasts the coffee mm. or evenly more quicker, and I presume healthier. And this is something that is being uh, talked about more and more because the big drum roasters um, all use propane. Oh. And both of the roasting operations use propane to, uh, as the heat source for their big commercial roasters. So now I have a, a saying with, um, I call my machine the power roaster. And I say, buy green, roast clean. Yeah. But it's a, a cleaner, more efficient process doing it with the hot air. So that's kind of how, how I evolved. You know, I evolved just from my, my barbecue grill. And this is in my, uh, my book that recently came out, which is called mm -hmm. Coffee, the Fourth Wave, A Fresh Roasting Revolution. And um, I have uh, uh, pictures of my evolution, how I started with, the barbecue grill, how I evolved into a commercial uh, roaster, and now how I am wanting to bring roasting into the home. Yeah. Because ultimately, the, pers the, the end user is who I want to experience, who, who I want to uh, have the experience of roasting themselves, mm -hmm. however they like it roasted, light, medium, dark, changing it up, being able to have control of that process, which I think is so important, and experiencing what that fresh roasted coffee is like. And in the end, you save money because oh, buying yeah. coffee is a fraction of the cost is buying already roasted coffee. Yeah, that is awesome. I, I, I love how it was the epiphany moment. I remember the first like crazy cup that I had was a um, El Eden a Mexican sun-dried natural. And I was like, oh my God, this is ridiculous. Like you taste cherry, you can taste all these notes. And it like completely changed my mindset of like, here's what I like, here's how coffee is, like here's what I need to have. But I agree 100% with bringing these things into the home. I mean, cafes, one, you're paying like four bucks, five bucks for a nice cup of coffee. Like if you're going and actually getting a cup of coffee that's roasted at the cafe, yeah. Compared right. to like, I mean, Starbucks is a charging you outrageous and it's roasted in a factory somewhere. There's all these additives. You're getting all the BS. But then if you can bring it in home, the preference is yours. And that's like a completely right. different mindset. Right. Yeah, exactly. And you can, you can like you just uh, mentioned, you can try different processes. A dry natural process is a very different taste than a wet process. Oh yeah, you know, and, and uh, uh, it retains. Be what the dry process means is that the coffee seed is the seed of a coffee cherry. Uh, the cherry is dried naturally, let's say in the sun. So all of those um, nutrients and all of that juice is kind of being absorbed by yeah. the coffee bean, and it's a uh, uh, much more fruity. Uh, flavors and I believe must have a lot more antioxidants in it. so it must be um, quite a bit uh, healthy and this is something I say must be because 
none of this stuff has really been studied in a lab. Yeah. And I want to open a lab to study exactly what is in these different coffees, in what quantities, what kind of chemicals are we talking about? Because it's a lot more than caffeine. If it was oh, yeah. just caffeine, then people would just be reaching for a caffeinated drink in the morning, caffeinated soda or something like that. Mm -hmm. But coffee is much more preferred uh, and the fresh roasted um, over any other coffee because it contains a lot more chemicals than coffee that has uh, yeah. been for a while. Yeah, and I'm the same. I'm, you know, like I just ran out of my coffee here and I go to a local cafe that roasts. But if I run out, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not uh, foregoing and drinking something else that is like a Starbucks or like whatever was just right. there. I'm like, okay, I'll drink something else for now until I can get another bag of fresh coffee. Because otherwise, I don't care. I don't need it. It's not quality. There's no reason in my mind. Uh -huh. Yeah, because once you taste the difference, once you taste how good it can be, you don't, you know, you, you're, you're awakened and you don't want to go back to um, uh, how you either you used to drink it or, or what is currently available for the masses, which is uh, um, coffee that is really inferior to what we're talking about. And, you know, if it made a little difference, if it made a little bit, you know, I can understand that, you know, it wouldn't be such a big deal. Yeah. But and it makes this much of a difference. And the people who home roast are this passionate about their home roasting and never giving it up. And that's when you realize that, that this, is, this is something that is, uh, is here to stay. And more and more people are going to discover it and are going to be converted to. Uh, oh, yeah. Roasting. Yeah, and I, I love the, the notion of the chemicals in it and the fact that you know, most people don't think about how things are processed. So propane as the processing mechanism or like charcoal, I know can have effects on meat um, because you're burning something which is going into what you're cooking. Right. Or if you get a package of something and it's in plastic, a lot of times that can have the same effect on what you're eating. That's awesome that the way this is moving is towards air, which you know, you got to hope it's fresh air or something, you know, if you're in a city and you're using like disgusting uh, factory air or whatever it is. But uh, that's a whole nother mindset that I think a lot of people aren't familiar with. And it leads me to, uh, you do a lot of talking about consciousness, coffee, freshness, how it affects you, your energy, your mood, everything. I really wanted to dive into that. And um just where that came about and where you started to really think about these two interplays of massive topics, but they come together just like everything in life. Yeah, absolutely. And that was one of the, one of my earliest uh, discoveries is, is uh, how I was um, uh, experiencing this fresh roasted coffee. When I started roasting it myself, uh, I'm like, it was so powerful. I knew I had to sit down with the cup. You know, yeah. it's not something that I, stand up, drink the cup, and then go on with my day. It's like, wow, this is really amazing. I got to sit down and meditate with this stuff, right? Yeah. And that's what I started doing. And I started noticing that this isn't just caffeine. This isn't just awakening, you know, senses in my mind. I am getting insight. It feels like there are areas of my brain that are being um, stimulated <clears throat> and there are areas that have to do with happiness, that have to do with inspiration, that had to do with ideas, you know. Th 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 there's so much going on. And when I started to do some further studying uh, about it, these chemicals, first of all, you, you can't go online and say these are the chemicals in coffee. All anyone mm -hmm. ever talks about is caffeine. Yep. Like a caffeinated beverage, and that's it. And yet, when you look at what happens during the roasting process, it says – there are something like a thousand to fifteen hundred chemicals <laughs> created during roasting. Yeah, you know, whoa, that's a hell, that's a hell of a lot of chemicals. You know, what is it? What what is in there? And, yeah. and that's never been studied because what happens is when when you roast the coffee beans, so there are all these processes that uh, occur. And gases are created. And one of the gases that is created is CO2, 
carbon dioxide. This is also the only thing that, that uh, people ever talk about. And what happens, the coffee bean is porous. So after these gases are created, they start leaving the coffee bean immediately after roasting. And this process takes about, in my estimation, about one week for all the gases to leave the porous coffee bean, for the coffee bean to kind of, it kind of stops breathing out, and then oxygen can come in and oxidize it, which further kills off uh, some of these beneficial elements. And oxidation of, of food like that is similar to having an apple, cutting open an apple, leaving it sit out mm. uh, in the air, and it's browning, right? Uh -huh. That brown is, that's, that's oxidation. So uh, understanding that uh, uh, this process is happening, um, and, and this is why, by the way, the big coffee companies, they roast the coffee and they put it in one-way sealed, vacuum-sealed bags, have one-way valves. That one-way valve is for these gases created in this coffee bean to escape, to go out that valve, but without oxygen coming in, mm -hmm. right? So they fresh roast it, and let's say they pack it. Day it was roasted, or two days later, three days later, there's still gases that are leaving. That's why they have to have that one way mm. valve, or else that bag will blow up. Yeah. Right? And the only people that package uh, without the one way valve is it's already after the seven days. So yeah. all those gases have already escaped. Uh -oh. And what I noticed is that the closer to roasting, the more stimulating my brain is getting. Right. And so my question always had been, what are these gases? What is going on? Uh, it's not just CO2 leaving. I feel a lot more than that. CO2 is odorless, tasteless, right? I mean, uh, um, it wouldn't have any effect. I know that there are gases because the closest gases that are affecting my brain, because the closer I'm getting to roasted, mm -hmm. the more I'm feeling that, totally. right? So I know something's going on, not sure what. After further research, looking back at when coffee was first discovered, which was in Ethiopia, like yep. the, the year 800 AD, something like that. There are all these different legends uh, about how this um, the shepherd uh, had his flock, and this is in Ethiopia, and they were eating the cherries off this tree, and he noticed that they were all happy and skipping and jumping yeah. around and all this kind of stuff. That's the legend. And um, so we discovered that it wasn't the fruit so much, but the seeds inside the fruit. And then what you had to do with the seeds inside the fruit is roast them because that's what creates this process, these chemical processes that create um, all these chemicals, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I realized that the first users of coffee back to near where it was discovered were the monks. Yep. And what they were doing is they were roasting their coffee, they were making their coffee, and they were using this to stay up at night during periods of prayer. Now, during periods of prayer, raising their consciousness, kind of connecting yeah. with uh, the um, uh, source energy, if you want to call it that. Yeah. They're getting high off this stuff. Yeah. Right? <laughs> They're doing something with it that is assisting them in attaining higher states of consciousness, wakefulness, enlightenment in general, right? So that's where I started from. I said, that's what's happening here. Totally. And what do they do in Ethiopia? There's something called the Ethiopian coffee ceremony. And they've been doing it for over a thousand years and they still do it the same way today. And what the Ethiopian coffee ceremony is, is they roast, grind, and brew in that order with as little time in between. Yeah. Now, they don't have the same equipment that we had. You know, let's say they don't have electricity, right? So they, they're roasting in a pan over an open fire, right? After yeah. that, coffee's roasted. They're letting it cool to room temperature. Then they're grinding it, and they're grinding it with a mortar and pestle, <laughs> right? Which... If you've never done that before, it's going to make a lousy cup of coffee because it's very, don't try it at home. Yeah. It's very difficult no. to do. Totally. But, you know, they're skilled at it and they're getting a really fine grind, right? And then they're, they're brewing it with hot water. 
And people who go to Ethiopia who have sat down at the ceremony, which takes maybe two to four hours, right? Because of the way they're hand doing the ceremony. Totally. They say it's the most incredible cup of coffee and experience they've ever had. Because what they're doing is roast, grind, and brew in that order. Mm-hmm. Now, they still do the same ceremony today. And my question was, you know, if they've been doing the same cer- ceremony for a thousand years, wouldn't you think that someone would have tried something differently, like said, hey, you know, let's roast and save it for tomorrow, or yeah. let's have this <laughs> next week, you know, or, or let's try some different things. You better believe they experimented. Oh, yeah. Every permutation possible, you know, grind it now, have it tomorrow. I mean, every every different way they could do it, you know that they experimented with, mm-hmm. and they still do the same uh, procedure today. So in my mind, that says this is the best way to do it. They've been doing this for so long. Oh, yeah. They know. Okay, how can I duplicate this procedure? And I found it's very easy and possible to take this coffee ceremony, compact it in a small amount of time because our lives here are a lot different than living in the bush in Ethiopia and having plenty of hours to do this, right? You have to get to work. You know, how, how much time do you have for your own personal coffee ceremony in the morning? You know, maybe 15 minutes? Well, wow. We have the machinery and the capability to be able to duplicate this process in 15 minutes and give people that incredible, high and inspired, energetic, positive outlook on the day. You know, what a gift that is. And the thing is, coffee, it's the first thing in the morning. It's it's the um, transition between unconsciousness or sleep state right? Into physical waking state. So now yeah. you're physically awake in, in, in the physical manifestational world and you have things to do. Coffee is the perfect bridge for those two states. So that's why I think there's a very strong link between coffee and consciousness. Totally. Transitioning from an unconscious state to a conscious aware state and the more fresh roasted it is, the um, more focused you are mm-hmm. in, in that state. And mm-hmm. if focus, I mean, that's really the perfect word because <clears throat> we're focusing mechanisms. And that's what coffee assists us in doing, to focus. Totally. Focus on whatever it is uh, that we're doing. If we're, if we're feeling kind of out of sorts, okay, we drink a cup of coffee, the fresher roasted, the better. And boom, we're right into being able to focus on any tasks that we're doing, any uh, thinking thought processes that we have in front of us, that kind of thing. So, so I say coffee is the drug for human consciousness. Yeah. yeah. In the physical world. I mean, there are other, you know, uh, uh, cannabis is a drug for human consciousness, but in the non-physical, yeah. you know, in a different kind of, in a different kind of ways. And you have, uh, psilocybin, which is also yep. uh, in oh, an expanded, very different way. But yeah. in the physical world, if you're here, you have a job, you have tasks to perform, coffee is the, the drug and the drug of choice for that, um, for that kind of thing. It's, a, it's, it's the most widely used psychoactive drug on the planet. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think... Why, and my goal has been, okay, how can I make the best drug possible? Yeah, seriously. But I mean, even on top of that, it's, you know, Starbucks and stuff. Like one, anybody who's listening, if you want to see the freshness between two, go to a local cafe or home roast and get Starbucks. And then one of the easiest ways to see it immediately is just on the bloom of whatever you're going to do. So if you're making a V60, a Kalita, a French press, doesn't really matter that initial bit of water that you put in there, you'll see it blooms up, more CO2 is coming out of it. If it's fresh, if it's not, oftentimes the beans are oily and it's just, you're not gonna see anything. It's just gonna be flat and dull the whole time. And so you can almost see the life, literally, in the Absolutely, yeah. 
I, I, I do it with the French press. Uh, that's the best demo to do is to see the bloom. Yeah. I mean, it's like a volcano. It's like, look at the activity here. Okay, there's some active ingredients that are definitely in this coffee. That's yep. not in every coffee. What coffee do I choose? Yeah. Right? And I'm going to go to the fresh roasted because that's what's making me more alive, more aware, more energetic. Exactly. And I think a lot of people, you know, they become quote unquote reliant to coffee as they think it is. So they're drinking Starbucks, they're drinking Pete's or they're going horrible and they're getting Folgers or something along those lines, which is just, I can't even, it's not really coffee at that point. And I wonder, I always think about this is the addiction because of an additive that's been put in there and it, it constantly is in there you know, whether that's due to manufacturing or whatever it is, because the crops are getting the length of it sitting there and having to be preserved. There's got to be something else. Cause I know that like me personally, when I'm drinking good coffee and that's all I try to drink is the highest quality. And I go without it for two days. I'm fine. It's not like anything bad. Like I'm not like, Oh, I've got a headache. This is horrible. Like this is the worst thing ever. Right. There's a different type of buildup. So yeah, I, I, I think I, I think that's I think you're onto something there. I think that's true. I think there may I think there may be. You know, I mean, there's a lot of additives and a lot of different things we have no idea about. Yeah, like right? wine. Wine's a big one. There's like 50 additives. They don't have to put it on the bottles. They don't have to put it on the bottles because they don't want to put. There's lobbyists, of course, saying, okay, it's not a food, it's a drink, but it's theoretically a food. You don't have to put the calories. You don't have to put the ingredients. And wine is filled with stuff. Coffee's the same way. You don't get the wow. coffee ingredients. I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah, I'm not a big uh, uh, fan of uh, alcohol because it's such a downer, you know? Yeah, um, that, the opposite. One of the, one of the reasons why uh, I like coffee so much and uh, um, why I like to be in the coffee business because it's such an upper. People yeah. are so appreciative, you know, of a good cup of coffee. Wow, you serve them a good cup of coffee, you change their life. They're, you know, it, the the feeling is uh, um, uh, really great, so keeps me uh, keeps me going. Wanting to reach as many people as possible. Totally. So I wanted to go into well, one I have to ask: What's your favorite coffee varietal? Where is it from? Like, what it? What's your go-to if you can get any uh, any coffee? You know, uh, anything that's local. Anything I, local. I'm, I'm, because uh, so what I, the other thing I've discovered is that when coffee is really really fresh roasted, and I mm -hmm. discovered this by talking to other roasters, because other roasters, professional roasters, will talk about how coffee must rest, need to rest this two or three days, and 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 after three days, this taste comes out. You start to get that you know that taste of cranberries, yeah, and uh, you know I mean some pretty unique kind of flavors that they're always kind of talking about. And I never, I could never figure that out. First of all, because I can't distinguish that with my palate. I can't distinguish what those flavors are uh, because I'm having coffee fresh roasted on it. That, that's my key. I want to roast and then have it right away. And what I realized was that those flavors are not distinguishable when you're having fresh roasted coffee. Mm. Because the chemicals you're having uh, with the fresh roasted coffee overpower any of those flavors. Interesting. What roasters and what people are talking about is focusing on flavors that you can only taste after the coffee has deteriorated mm. to the point where all of this other stuff that's masking those flavors have left the coffee bean. And that's the stuff that I want. Yeah. That's the drugs. That's the part that I want to take in my body. So if you have one of those vacuum seal bags with the one-way valves, I would attach a bag next to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Capturing the gases. And that's the part that I want, you know? <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Do you, so, think, uh, do you think those flavors are coming from like an acidification type thing? Because a lot of times the flavors are more, less of the chocolatey, uh, tobacco -y flavors and more of the fruity flavors, which would be more acidic. And, uh, you know. the, the, the fruity flavors are definitely coming from the fruit. Mm -hmm. 
that is being absorbed by the cherry. Okay. The cherry fruit. And you do that, and, and because there's a lot more of those sour, kind of fruity, citrusy yeah. flavors in, in dry uh, processed uh, coffee. There's also more of those flavors in the closer you get to roasting mm. because those flavors are the first to leave. The citrusy, uh, sour uh, kind of taste, they're the first to go. You could, you could have a really fresh roasted shot of espresso and pull the shot, sip it right away, pull another shot and let it sit for 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it's a lot less citrusy, a lot less sour because those are always the first to leave. And I believe that there's a lot of antioxidants and a really lot of, yeah. uh, a lot of uh, healthy stuff that uh, is in, um, is in those uh, flavors. So I want local coffee, first of all, because wherever I am, if I'm in a coffee growing region, if I'm sourcing locally and those caught that co that green coffee has not uh, trans um, has not transferred over international borders, mm -hmm. then um, it's not fumigated. Green coffee that is imported, mm -hmm. exported that that goes over international fumigated all. Set or get visually inspired bug. If there are bugs, it's still fumigated. So my question is, how do you know it's fumigated or not? If someone's importing yeah. organic coffee and there were bugs and they fumigated, are they going to let people know it's not organic anymore? It's fumigated? I don't think so. No. Right. So I'm always sourcing local coffee. Bugs or not? I mean, that's the thing. You know, if bugs are eating it, that's probably what I want to eat. Yeah. You know, yeah. if 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 uh, <laughs> seriously. It's like, uh, Lettuces, right? That are sprayed. No, no bugs got on that. Why? Because chemicals. You know, if yeah, if, uh, if the bugs want it, then it's probably okay for me. <laughs> that's the totally. bug test. I think that's um, that's one of the misconceptions, though, too, of like the dirt, dirt and bugs being unnatural in a sense, whereas we're natural. It's like this weird separation of like we're on. We don't want the things that are naturally on it and that makes it fresh and that shows like, Hey, other natural beings want this, um, from the things that are like clean and too good. And they don't, you know, they look a lot different. Totally, man. Yeah, totally. It's, it's, we've been conditioned that way yeah. because we live in sterile homes and bugs are bad. Well, I live in Bali and it's open and I'll tell you, I'm, I'm, I have a relationship with bugs every day. Yeah, you know, I mean it's uh, it's part of um, especially in the jungle, yeah. uh, part of uh, life there, and it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it does it does get it. You have to get used to it. Yeah, uh, you grow up in in such a uh, sterile environment that I think that that we in the West have uh, kind of uh, grown up in. Oh yeah, yeah. So it brings that connection too, and that you know the more you get used to the opposite of the West, like sterile, um, everything has to be clean. It has to look good. Your fruit has to look good, which is like one of the most illogical things. If you think about it, it's like, shouldn't right. it just taste good? That's right. like the whole, like look good on in, uh, social media, but like mentally there's like the worst thing ever going on in the person's head. And you're like, this is, it's the same thing. You want your fruit to look good, but inside it's got a little bit of glyphosate from Monsanto. So that's being stored in your tissues. But yeah. the more you get in that connection, the more you you practice that gratitude towards the coffee and the coffee rewards you as you're giving it the positive energy and it goes back and forth. It's a two-way system. Right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so, um, yeah, so uh, I, I prefer what's local and I really tune into the energy of it. Um, so I was uh, recently in the Philippines and the Philippines is really interesting. It's one of the only countries in the world that grows all four major types of coffee. That's Arabica, Robusta, Liberica, and something called Excelsa. Mm -hmm. And you know, Arabica and Robusta mostly because those are the uh, two most common forms. And so 
the, the main thing I source is 100% Arabica, very important. And Arabica is considered the, the highest quality of any uh, coffee strain, right? Mm -hmm. Robusta is uh, interesting uh, in that it has the natural characteristics of a GMO product. Mm. Arabica only grows at elevation. Robusta doesn't have to grow at elevation. It can grow down to uh, sea level, right? The yields on Robusta are in Arabica. Robusta is resistant to a disease called leaf rust disease, which can wipe out and has, in the past, Arabica crops in whole, total countries. The, Fil the Philippines was wiped out by leaf rust disease in the wow. 1800s. They were the fourth largest producer in the world. They were wiped out, and uh, they really never made it back to that prominence as a, uh, a coffee producer. Totally. The other big thing is Robusta has twice the caffeine of Arabica. Hmm. Twice the caffeine. So... Most people don't know this, and when the, the, the Robusta also is a lot cheaper. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the big coffee companies use Robusta yeah. as filler. They, they use it because it's cheaper. They blend with it. Um, but the effects of Robusta, uh, caffeine-wise, I think it's overload for the human nervous system. A lot of people think they can't drink coffee because they get the shakes. It just, they're like, they're too sensitive to the caffeine. I used to think that until I was only drinking Arabica. Mm -hmm. And that effect stopped happening. I wasn't getting the shakes. I wasn't feeling nervous. And when we talk about coffee and consciousness, the effects of Arabica are a very focused buzz, right? I mean, it mm -hmm. really helps to focus consciousness. The effects of too much caffeine or uh, yeah. robusta is the opposite. It's unfocused. It's nervous. It's like, you know, you're, 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 you're hyper and a little, uh, yeah. uh, you know, makes you uh, a little crazy. And uh, I don't recommend it. I don't yeah. recommend it for anybody. And I think that um, if people were just choosing 100% Arabica, first of all, even I've had so many people who say, I can't drink coffee. I said, what coffee are you drinking? They don't know. I said, yep. it's probably a Robusta you're drinking. You know, My mom was like 100% that. Arabica, try that. It yeah. might have a completely different experience. So I think there's a whole market of people who think they can't drink coffee because they're too sensitive that they're drinking the wrong coffee. Um, so when I was in the uh, Philippines, getting back to that, uh, uh, they have a lot of native coffees, coffees there up in the uh, elevation where they grow. And these are trees that, I don't know, is it Arabica? Is it Robusta? It's kind of hard to know, but mm -hmm. they were native and, and the, the yields are less, it almost more specialized. So I started to experiment with that and feel what that feels like. So I do the same process, mm -hmm. fresh roast, grinding and brewing, the Ethiopian coffee ceremony in 15 minutes, right? and sitting down with that cup and meditating with it and tuning in to the effects. And these, these native coffees have really very different effects. They're gonna have different levels of these drugs. And that's the thing I really wanna study, want to quantify exactly mm -hmm. what drugs are in there and in what quantities, because all of these different native coffees have these, chemicals in different amounts yeah i think i want to uh, to to tune in so i can see having packaged green coffee and having a listing in the back of the amounts of these substances that are in each one yep. depending on how you roast it too light medium or dark it's going to change if you dark roast you're burning some of this stuff out that's what oh, yeah. starbucks does and they have a very dark roast so they they burn out the differences uh, so that every cup tastes the same in any Starbucks anywhere in the world. Yep. Even though these coffees are sourced from different growing areas, which make them different. So I, I prefer uh, local and yeah. tuning in to whatever, whatever uh, coffee it is. And I like experimenting with them um, uh, with different ones and seeing how uh, it makes me feel. Totally. Yeah. So 
I we I need to ask you about the other two of our idols in a second, but uh-huh. so you almost want to go the route of, you know, cannabis. Now they have like, you can get the listing of actually what chemical components are in it that are making you feel different ways and get that in a coffee. So it's more of like, I mean, that'll, that'll revolution like, because people can literally then go, you know, I can't normally have these chemical compounds. It's not really for me, but I would love these with the coffee at like, you know, 98 um, milligrams of caffeine per serving. Absolutely, man, you hit it right on. That's a really, that's really what I want to do because I want to take coffee out of the realm of taste alone yeah, and into the realm of drug effect and, and, and how this is feeling. It's kind of like uh, take a cup of coffee, right? And you are deteriorating it to the point where you can taste these flavors and you're going for a certain flavor in order to taste on your taste buds, right? And ignoring like the chemical factor, right? Yep. That's like taking cannabis. Yeah. Right. And um, using it in such a way that all you're going for is the flavor. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, the, and the, it has different flavors. So you want, Oh, but I don't taste that. You know, maybe I need to do another process. Yeah. Before ready yet maybe i need to soak it in water or something first i don't know but uh yeah. you know it's it's kind of like and you know who does that what are you yeah. after with the cannabis you're after the effect man exactly you know? yeah it's very similar to the way people treat food like you get like an amazing potato which has all these nutrients and then you're like now nah, let's uh put it like at the highest temperature in like the worst fat that the um, human has ever known like, make it salty too and then at that point, like I'm a huge fan of salt. I'm a huge fat, a fan of good fats and everything. But the way that most French fries are made are for addiction or for so you strip everything out. And all you get is the taste and you don't get the feel. And that's right. kind of the reverse psychology, the reverse human nature that we've become with, you know, food manufacturing processes and everything like that, food science. In a sense. And, and, and it, it's really being revolutionized. I mean, that whole area, people are really waking up. People are talking about this thing and we're looking at these different things, these nutrients, you know, um, in, um, and, and also what's, what's one thing that I've really uh, been experimenting with uh, lately this past month is intermittent fast. Yeah, I do that every day. Oh my God, it's unbelievable, man. I'm, yeah. it, it just changing you know, t- tweak, because I eat healthy anyway, but tweaking the times and stuff like that and understanding what goes on with human growth, hormone, yep. autophagy, all this kind of thing, it is so amazing. And you start to realize your body is a chemical factor. Oh, my God, yeah. Right? And oh, yeah. really can create anything. I mean, DMT, DMT yeah. uh, is a naturally occurring substance in your body, right? Yeah. yeah. Have got to figure out how to tap into that when you want it, right? <laughs> yeah, well, well, have you actually, because we'll stop. Uh, have you ever uh, heard of Dr. Joe Dispenza? Yes. Okay, so he has his guided meditations teach you how to actually tap into DMT. Oh, really? Um, by, yeah, so you, you, uh, you learn to basically contract the internal uh, organs and muscles around the spine. It pulls cerebral spinal fluid up to the brain hits the phalamic gate, can pop that open, floods the pineal gland, and then the crystals drop in. Oh, wow. All right, yeah. I'm going to look that up, man. <laughs> yeah. that, try. Uh, that was amazing. Crazy meditations. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. But, no, I mean, this, these bo- our body has so much capability, and when we, when we understand that what we put into it is either fuel or it's something that's fighting it, that's when we really learn how to master ourselves and our body and and work one in one with nature. But no, we were talking about DMT, the body, right. and uh, how amazing these things are, these natural components that we have available to us that are us. Experimenting and getting results and then sharing them. I mean, it's really exciting to see, you know. Um, I'm just inspired by, uh, you know, these guys uh, um, who've been doing the uh, intermittent fasting and talking about the processes and what's happening. And I've been an athlete all my life, you know, and there's a, a, I've always 
uh, wondered, you know, why I can't get the perfect body that I want, no matter how much I work out, you know, and it's kind of like that coffee thing. What are you eating? What kind of coffee are you using? You know, what kind of uh, food and when are you putting it in your body? But the idea that you can almost, you know, it's kind of like bypassing. You don't have to take steroids. But yeah. if you're doing it this way and getting human growth hormone, naturally your body producing it. Wow, how incredible is that, right? Yeah. Yeah, so have you found any brewing methods work better over the other for feeling? Yeah, I, I, uh, I definitely think espresso is the best. Really? I have, yeah, I'm very strong about that. A, a good espresso machine uh, will produce the most concentrated form of coffee, period. And when we were doing our testing, I was working with two sommeliers and we were blind taste testing this. And this is how I came up with uh, using it right after roasting. Uh, We were taste testing 24 hours after roasting Mm -hmm. versus 10 hours after roasting, just back and forth. Um, And at the time of my TED talk, actually, I'd only tested back to 11 hours, which is set, which, which is why I stated that I thought uh, 11 hours was the prime because I, I only had a yeah. commercial roaster at that point. I didn't have a personal roaster. But mm. since I created this personal roaster, I've been able to test back to immediately after roasting. And further testing has shown me that the closer to roasting, the more oomph, the more energy is in that shot of espresso. So I really like to test with uh, the espresso to be able to feel it. I mean, hands down, the espresso machine, the Italians, uh, yeah. innovation and contribution to coffee. It's not growing coffee. It's just the espresso machine. It is, it creates the most intense concentrated form of coffee hands down. I mean, nothing really comes close. Yeah. It's really that, that amazing. So, uh, yeah, I prefer, uh, uh, espresso and, um, I mean, I don't have an, uh, espresso machine at home when I use a stovetop espresso, a mocha pot. Mm. And it does, you know, a pretty good job of having a concentrated espresso. But uh, in testing, I always prefer to have a you know, good espresso machine. 25-second yeah. pull uh, on that shot, one and a half ounces. It's full of crema. Um, wow, that's, that's the best, I think. Awesome. Okay, that is good to know. And then mocha pie, if you can't have that next French press or anything like that, or what? Uh, there's so much in between, you know, there's AeroPress, there's pour overs, there's, uh, there's anything. Um, I would put the French press towards the making the weaker, weakest kind of coffee, unless Mm -hmm. you're using more volume of coffee and you're grinding finer and then has its own uh, difficulties with that. So that's why I like the, uh, the mocha pot. It's inexpensive. It's available to anybody. Even if you're camping, you just need a a fire need electricity right um so it it uh does a uh, yeah it does a, a a pretty good job awesome awesome so i i need to ask is there do you have any i would say higher leverage skills that have allowed you to get to where you are today so higher leverage skill is something you learn in one field it's almost like that epiphany you had with uh coffee the flavor and it not being the barista skills but it actually being the thing that allows you to pick up that mindset and put it into other things to learn better, to, you know, function better. Is there any higher leverage skills that you would say that you've been using that have just helped you get to where you are today? The, the, the only thing is uh, relying on myself and having, and having the confidence Mm -hmm. that what I'm experiencing is legitimate and I don't need an outside source to confirm that what, my findings are, are true and that other people uh, have experienced that, you know, I've always been an entrepreneur. I've always been uh, wanting to, uh, to do my own thing, my own way. And I think that has been the the key component in that because most people, if they discover something and then people tell, Oh, that's not true. You know, and they hear that enough times, then they'll just, they'll just dismiss it. (laughs) Like their experience isn't valid. And yep. I think that's a really very important thing when, when you are um, confident in your discovery and realizing that this could be something that is a breakthrough, then, wow, I think you're, you know, you're onto something. So I think that's a very important uh, point. But 
as far as other skills, I don't think at all. No, <laughs> you know. Yeah, no, I uh, love I've never been a real foodie or anything like that. The only thing I'd say is that at the time that I made this discovery with the fresh roasted coffee is that I had just converted to eating raw food. Mm. So I was tuning in to the energy and the power in raw foods. So I yeah. got to the point where I could, I could uh, experience it. I could taste the difference. I could feel the difference in my body. And tuning into that body, well, I guess as an athlete too, you know, you're more tuned into oh, yeah. your body because you're using it every day. And I've always been an, uh, an athlete my whole life. So that has really uh, helped as well. Awesome. I, I love that. Um, the confidence to understand that your experience is valid, which is like, if you don't under, if you don't believe that your experience is valid, it's like, are you living? In a yeah, sense? You're, you're a sheep, right? I mean, you're just going along with the flock because you're, and you're just accepting what the mainstream is saying. Yeah. And that's the whole, this whole idea of waking up. We're finally understanding exactly. and what the mainstream is is saying uh, there's an agenda attached. Yep. Right. Seriously. Yeah. I mean, and that's what I love uh, now that it's becoming more uh, readily able to, I guess, access the little language around waking up, which is helping to understand what it is and like how people are like, Oh, Oh, so I did this. And like this happened. I love that something like a cup of coffee, you know, an experience, a meeting, one, uh, hearing a couple words, like all that now is like really powerful for people to come yeah. about and start to question things, which does lead me to my next question, which is there anything that you're currently questioning? And it would be something like a mass consensus that everybody's like, yeah, it works that way. And you're like, I don't really think it works that way. Oh man, there's a lot. <laughs> awesome. Uh, what I'm discovering, I mean, uh, that there's a lot, and uh, um, you know, I could say it, and people people would think, uh, okay, it could dismiss everything I've said up to that point just based on that one thing because mm -hmm. it's uh, it's so ingrained. But the the way I got there is, uh, I started homeschooling my daughter. Yeah. Um, and I started having to find out. You know, I'm not a teacher, but uh, I need to homeschool her. What am I going to teach her? And I started looking at different subjects in different areas. And what I uncovered in my research was yeah. mind blowing, you know, and I went, whoa. I mean, th th this was stuff that I felt like I was taught in school something completely opposite. Yep. You know, and that, wow, this is like, uh a brand new understanding of things and and that's really where it uh, came out of because i was like well you know what am i gonna what am i gonna teach her realize yeah. that what the schools are teaching the kids is like the old school is yeah. work for a company get a job it's not like be an entrepreneur and think for yourself so yeah. my message to my daughter started to be don't believe anything unless you can corroborate it for yourself. Listen yep. to everyone, keep an open mind, but it has to feel right and you have to prove it to yourself before you start believing things. Yeah. Because you are fed so much stuff that um, has an agenda attached, you know? Yeah, yeah. seriously. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I'm a huge advocate of uh, intellectual honesty. And I think a lot of times people get uh, mad because it's not that I act like I know everything. I know what I know and I'm defensive with what I do know in the sense of unless you can provide some sort of information, which changes my opinion, because I am open to everything. Right. I'm not going to believe something because you heard someone say something and right. they are attributing the source to they you know, right. like everyone does. Oh, you know, no, they, they figured it out. It's like, who's right. they? They're like, right. I don't know. It's just, I heard it, you know? That's right. That's right. We, 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 we give up too much, um, to professionals, mm -hmm. we give up too much to science, yep. we give up too much, uh, to, 
uh, what we've been conditioned to think are people who are in the know. Yeah. And what I'm encouraging with coffee is just try it. Yeah. You know, I, I tried it this way. Hey, wow, I had this experience. Just try it. You know, yeah. it's like the intermittent fasting guys. It, it's like they try it this way. I'm seeing the results. Yeah. Just try it. Okay, man, I want to try it. You know, I'm open to it. I'm yeah. open to seeing things in a, in a different new light. And, and that's really what makes life so exciting is because people are coming yeah. up with discoveries and it's all happening at the same time. Like you said, there's an awakening, there's a reawakening and people are, are sharing. And now it's just gotten to the point where we, um, um, we've got that critical mass so yeah. that uh, the, sh the, the sharing uh, does validate each other to, and, and pushes us to seek further information, you know, totally. and to experiment on ourselves. Yeah. I think that's, that's the key. If you're not willing to experiment with your own, your own body and your own ideas and your own brain, yep. then um, I don't think you can get anywhere. Yeah. 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 And I think, yeah, I'm i uh, I'm very against the traditional path of education and understanding because it's all told through a lens and yep. that lens, like people don't understand that even textbooks are all biased and right. they're biased based on, the people who wrote it and then they're biased on who taught them what was right. going on. And, and the it, teachers are taught from the textbook. Teachers are taught, this is what you have to teach. So what, you know, where's it coming from? Yeah, exactly. It's just regurgitation. And anyone who's played the game telephone knows how good information gets to you when it's regurgitated nine times. It's, you know, we need, the more that we start to think for ourselves and put pieces together, because we are the people who have to learn, like, I, I say this all the time and it's just a truth, but you know, most doctors don't question anything the whole time that they go through everything they're doing. And if they do, they're told, no, you're dumb. You're not a doctor yet. You don't know what you're talking about. And then once they're a doctor, they become the expert of everything when it relates to health, when it's like, you didn't study any of this stuff. We know you're a doctor. Good. That's fine. But health you don't know about a doctor right. knows how to cure an illness. It doesn't know how to prevent the illness. That's treat an illness. I don't know about cure an illness. Yeah. But treat, treat an illness. Treat. Cure I like that. An, an emotional thing. And it's something that's uh, yep. right underneath. And then it's follow the money. You know, who's paying the doctors? It's been yep. pharmaceutical companies, Yep. you know, and, and who's teaching the doctors in these, uh, in these big schools, who, who where's the money coming from behind it? You got to look at all that stuff and realize there's agendas. Yeah. And and, uh, and these agendas have affected us for decades now and hundreds yep. hundreds of years, you know. And it's time to finally start waking up from that and start questioning everything and tuning into your own being and body and mind and seeing how it feels. Yeah. I think when, we, when we're able to intuit and and tune into our intuitive sense, that's where we discover some truths. I think that um, oh yeah, we don't ordinarily uh, uh, access. That's not taught in schools. Why not? No. Uh, <laughs> seriously, if they taught people to stop questioning themselves and questioning external information, then people would be, you know, more confident. They walk around happier, better, live more lively lives. It's just, right. but you know, and I'm a huge nerd when it comes to like how things were written, and I think it was in. 1920s when uh rockefeller helped create the general education um uh doctrine or whatever it was and basically like they put bells in there because it conditions you just like a factory and it gets you ready for the factory and they did all these things so you'd be the perfect factory worker who doesn't complain and who takes the work does the work goes home falls asleep comes back does the work goes home falls asleep and that's exactly what they needed at the time Yep. Because the Industrial Revolution, they needed workers. So how are they going to train their workers? Oh, let's start them in school, yep. right? Yeah. And then it right. becomes exactly, exactly right. You're not, you're not, you're not taught yeah. to think independently. Think on your own. Uh. -uh. But you know, money tries to breed more money for itself, and that's. But it's good that uh, it's good that we're you know we're we're waking up to that now, and 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 more and more people you know you talk to, uh, I know just. Five years ago, uh, you know, talking like this, there's a lot less people who uh, oh, yeah. are really understanding it. 
and now you know every every day more and more people are really kind of uh, catching on and waking up yeah it's it's beautiful to see so before we sign off where can people find you uh so online uh coffeetruther.com uh, I also have a website for my new Power Roaster. It's uh, powerroaster.com. Um, my YouTube channel, Coffee University, there's a ton of videos in there that teaching all different things uh, about coffee. Um, my TED Talk, if someone hasn't seen my TED Talk, I, I think that's the, really the first uh, place to go because uh, that uh, reaches a lot of people and it's 11 minutes and people can yeah. kind of really get my story and where I'm coming from, from, from that. And other than that, email me. I love uh, doing podcasts. I love doing interviews. I love getting this information out there. I think it's really very important. Uh, it's, it's a movement that right. um, I'm creating and I call it the fresh roasting revolution because it is um, challenging the status quo and how, we look at coffee and how we treat coffee. And my email is I'll share at powerroaster.com. And awesome. um, you know, I love talking to uh, to people and continuing this process and trying to educate and reach as many people as possible. And then it's like, try it, just try what I'm saying, right? Yeah. Just give it a shot, see if it makes a difference. If it makes a big difference, wow, it can change lives. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. I'm pretty thank sure. You, awesome. I'm going to be getting one of your power roasters real soon and then hook that up and maybe I'll bring you back on. We could walk through it because oh, cool. it's uh, definitely something that I've been thinking about doing for a long time. Oh, cool. So we're towards the end uh, uh, of our production, but uh, I'll definitely uh, put one aside for you. Awesome. And, uh, we'll have to, uh, uh, have to check that out. Sounds good. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Been a pleasure. Thank you.